today is a deep dive into yeast genetics and what makes them amazing organism. I'm really excited for today's stream, y'all. We're going to be chatting all about um, not just why yeast are an amazing organism, but we actually get to do... Um, we're going to take a look into the... I actually have access to the, some of the talks that were at the yeast genetics meeting, and we'll actually watch one of them, uh, the guy who won the, yeast, the Lifetime Achievement Award, and you can actually see like all that he's done with yeast to inform us about basic biology, which is amazing, I think. I don't remember exactly, Thindal, if it was yeast. I th it may have been yeast. But yeah, that um, saved the world from the wooden apocalypse and figured out how to nom on cellulose. I believe that was yeast, Thindal. Thindal, yeast has been utilized with so many approaches and genetics. Um, and actually, like, yeast, you can get to synthesize any protein that you want in any e. coli. Those are the two that are kind of readily used for that front. And so it's amazing to note how much fundamental biology exists when using yeast and that we've discovered using yeast that we almost kind of disregard. Um, and even modern day uh, funding agencies tend to disregard because they're like, oh, it's a yeast cell. Like, what all can we learn about it? But the t you can utilize it as, a, as an amazing tool, um, which I'm excited about to chat with y'all. Part one into yeast genetics. I think it'll be a multi-part series that we're, we're going to do. Um, we're going to basically chat about what makes yeast a powerful organism to study from, why we should study yeast, think, you know, what makes it like a special thing to learn from. Um, we're going to do some life cycle stuff on the yeast as well. And then I don't, I hope, you know, we may not get to it today, but I do have the presentation um, where it's a gentleman who goes, who won the yeast lifetime achievement award. Um, at this past East Genetics meeting, and it's a really, really cool kind of summary of 30 years worth of his work. Um, and it's just... Whether you're... I, it's, it's just cool to, to learn about, like, all the amazing things that this guy has done for the fundamental field of just biology. So, that's kind of what we're gonna... That's kind of the direction we're going in. And then... Since we're going to do this multi, like a couple of streams, um, the next stream will also chat about um, like other presentations as well that were given at this uh, sem like at this conference of like what makes yeast, you know, again an amazing organism. How you can use yeast to study human diseases um, because it's it's usually discounted, right? It's just like oh. It's just yeast. Like, what are yeast? Why are yeast good? And so I think one nice place to start is what is a model organism? So why do scientists use these simple animals to ask questions about fundamental biology? And I think that's a good starting place for us. And it's not just, we're not just going to go into, like, this one's more of a generic one of talking about um, yeast flies and other organisms as to why we study them but the principles of why what defines a model organism and why we study a model organism that those themes are the same across all of these creatures so it's not particular to just this one video like even in the what they're talking about fly it's the same thought process used as to why you would study something in yeast 60 percent of the genes in a fruit fly are also found in humans so if you mutate genes in fly that are also present in human, you could perhaps find out what that gene does and how to fix a mutation. You can actually even humanize a fly. You can put in human genes into a fly, and then you can put in the human mutant genes and ask what happens. Yeah, which I think is amazing to examine human changes in the human genome that affect our, our health. If you can figure out how to treat it in an organism that's quote unquote simpler, you know, even though it's a fly or a yeast molecule, like a yeast cell, the basic biology that governs like how cells and proteins fold isn't going to change between organisms. So if it's something like that and you can fix it in a, in a yeast cell or a fly, maybe you can fix it in something more complicated. But 
you have to figure out the simplest route first before you can get into those most co more complex things, which is pretty cool, right? So you, if you find the drug that can stop the neuronal overgrowth in the fly, maybe it would work in a mammal too. So yeasts are primarily for much more rudimentary cellular behavior, like cell division, um, the, the cytoskeletal structure, um, the structure of the nucleus, proteins, like how they interact. Um, it doesn't mean they're not very powerful. Those fundamental features of biology are seen in disease models. They're also seen dysregulated in humans and other animals too. This is a, a fundamental question. So like how do pieces of the cell internally move to their, like the location they're supposed to go to? You think that's something very simple and we know, but we don't even fully understand it now. So yeah, yeast genetics, Chad. I just wanted to highlight that. Um, nope. Five Nobel Prizes, 01 to 6, 2009, 13, and 16. Let's continue on with our deep dive into yeast. Uh, we talked about why to use model genetic systems, like what makes them easier and better to study. And so let's actually get a little bit um, into the nitty gritty on, on yeast and why it makes them amazing. Yes, it is like baking yeast, uh, Vandranel. So they, they are, um, they are utilized to study the foundational biology that's present in you and me, like humans, um, which I think is really, really cool. And soon, like they even can humanize the yeast cells. So you can look at like cell growth and like put in a human disease causing gene such as something that maybe could help like promote cancer um and then you can ask uh what allows for uh like what drug can lessen the growth and maybe it would work in higher organisms as well so you can move from yeast to then fruit flies to then mice and then hopefully get at like identifying in humans because if you can fix something and learn how something works in something really simple it's much easier to make that same connection or figure it out in something more complicated because you already know the basic principles that govern it. But that's something that we'll be able to do is actually under the microscope. We'll be next weekend, I think we'll do, we'll take a look and see like, we'll actually get some dividing yeast cells in there just by doing that rehydration stuff. And see those little blebs are actually the, that's why they're called budding yeast. And that's why our SciComm character is called Bud and buddy the yeast because you can see a little growth happening there and there are the little buds happening here you can actually see them growing in real time until they split so basic biology here is like how do the how does the dna replicate to allow for this budding like like how does the dna move into the bud and stay in the original like how does it replicate how do the the cells and organelles move around how do the organelles replicate how do the cytoskeleton move things around fundamental biology that we can learn from yeast and um these right here Y'all can see them. Those are called budding scars. So after the yeast divide and the bud pops off to form a new yeast cell, there's actually a little like residual left on there and that's called the yeast sc bud scar. And that's what you're seeing on there. So you can actually track how many times this yeast cell has divided by the scar count. So I like this little short documentary because it actually goes into not just like some of the historical elements of yeast, but also what is their function in the wild because that's one question that some of our when we chat about organisms like what's the point like what it, why is it alive what is it doing in the wild and that's something that we can ask and then we'll get into like what the genetics are and the point of their genetics so it's like we can like multi-layer we can talk about what these organisms are for so guys the cool part is the yeast you can put in genetic information from a different animal and the yeast cells will create that will like because the cellular machine is all there right it reads the dna turns dna to rna rna is then made into protein the yeast cell can do that so if you put in some kind of genetic element that isn't native to it like an ant protein or human protein or whatever the yeast just goes about its merry way and it'll start synthesizing it and it, you can make a lot of it and synthesize like bucket loads of whatever you put in um, which is really remarkable and it tends not to kill there are some things that could kill the yeast too if you start synthesizing cell death proteins um but for the most part they just secrete it 
you can put on a little tag on the protein that it'll be pushed out of the yeast cell and it'll be free floating in the solution that the yeast are being held in and then you just harvest the solution and you do a couple of tricks to separate out by mass or size and then you get a whole vat of the protein of interest which is pretty remarkable just like drugs so like pharmaceuticals that we can use to treat diseases can be synthesized by them also um genetic tricks in yeast can be utilized um yeah i think it, there's i think insulin is done by them golganac insulin is also done by e coli so that's the other thing that also is readily utilized um both of them you can put in genes from different organisms and synthesize and have them secrete it uh both of those are readily utilized in the, in the labs how cool would that be if we're chatting about having too much carbon dioxide because of the greenhouse gases if you could utilize yeast to pull in co2 and synthesize something else that could be a game changer right there so let's actually talk about the life cycle of yeast and i like this professor's explanation is quite nice um she is a professor at the university of leicester in england um and actually has been awarded several like not the nobel but like yeast specific awards um for her work and like the fundamentals of like cellular biology using yeast as an organism to ask those questions um so they start off the yeast cells start off as haploid maybe they have one copy of the chromosomes you and i our cells are diploid two copies of every chromosome they have two chromosome types as well. They have A type and alpha type. And A and alpha type cells can mate to perform, to make a diploid organism. So you can't ever get AA or alpha alpha. You have to get A alpha. That's the, um, that's the mating type that you can get to make them diploid we're having two copies of the chromosome so both budding and sexual reproduction for the yeast thing yes golganac so if they are haploid so they have one copy of the chromosomes they can do the budding behavior in which point case they will duplicate their chromosomes so they have two copies of the a but the moment they duplicate it the cells divide and then they go back to having one copy and then they can also do sexual reproduction through a, um, they have a tube that's formed and they, that tube is called the shmoo. Uh, and that, that's how they mate. So and they have to have that mating tube and only one of the chromosomes can encode for the mating tube. So that, that what she's saying now, Golganak, it, that line that's going like this is a self renewing. So that's reproduction asexually. It'll just keep reproducing by budding. So that's their mating types. They can either self renew by budding or they can mate, but they have to, they can't, like we said, mate AA or alpha alpha. They have to mate A alpha. It has to be two of those different chromosomes from the two different types to come together and actually do that mating behavior. Um, which again is really cool. It's very simple, but it causes there to be then genetic variation in the system. They are they are both just buddies in in the sense that so both of them can bud um like asexually if that makes sense both the a's and the alphas can do the budding behavior on their own when they're haploid and then they mate and then they produce um the diploid cell so basically what she's saying is we can go take this diploid animal that has two copies of all the chromosomes and force it to go back to being haploid so force it to go back to having one copy of each chromosome and when you do that what's really cool is if there's any genetic recombination or switching between genetic elements so if there was a little piece of that red that ended up on the black and a little piece of black that ended up in the red chromosome you'd actually be able to see that which i think is really remarkable and what's neat is i don't i can't remember if she says that but you see how there's four each of those four cells now have a single copy of the chromosome and because there's four this body that's going to eventually pop open and release the spores the body is called the tetrad because there are four molecules in or four cells in there so tetra four tetra i i don't know i think it's very elegant and it 
it makes me smile that it's called a tetrad. So one of the amazing things that you can do with yeast is genetic scre screens or drug screens. Let's say you have a yeast cell that as the earlier video mentioned, you've humanized, right? So you've made it so they start for forming aggregates of proteins um, that are similar aggregates to a human disease, right? Like you can model um, trisomy 21 because it's aggregates from a mutation called the protein D scam. Let's say we have these yeast cells that make all of these like aggregating bad proteins. And let's say you have 10,000 molecules that you want to test and see if of one of those 10,000 molecules, do any of them stop this extra protein aggregation? Do any of them fix the problem? Can you imagine individually dropping 10,000 times uh, times three for your no you can't do that so you do this use this machine but back to why yeast and the mating of yeast that's we got we got a little bit derailed there because we got excited we got excited the tetrads and so that's that's where that derail went to that we can use um the tetrad picker that we were just looking at earlier that piece of machinery to separate them out physically but yeah this is really cool so two of the cells are going to stay alpha and a as they originally were and then the other two that had the recombination will have feet bits of both and that can be informative of what genes are doing what in their importance level how does the dna move around is what she's studying all right guys i think let's go ahead and pivot over to the one of the the yeast sessions um and just hear from this gentleman who has been working on yeast for over 30 years um, he has a very impressive resume and I'll let the intro the speaker introduce him and tell you why he's so cool and then he actually has a talk and we're probably going to stop a fair bit throughout to talk about some of the founding principles of the work that he's done why it's cool it's not always the most straightforward of explanations but that's why me being here we can talk about some of these principles and why they're really amazing and it's a it's like a 30 minute presentation. We may or may not finish tonight. If we don't finish it tonight, we'll finish it next Saturday. Uh, and this is one of the presentations I have access to for until September 13, I think, something like that. So we have at least this week and next week. Thanks for watching Science Media. And be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons to help our channel grow and support our science outreach and education goals. We can be found on Twitch most days of the week, and be sure to join us here for our next video. Thanks again, and stay curious, everyone.